welcome to all my dear uh, friends and members of the white army today we are really uh, feel privileged and blessed to have uh, professor uh, vimala madam uh, as a mentor and teacher she is a uh, uh, retired from uh, government medical college kottayam as a professor of nephrology and uh, her passion is teaching and she is teacher of teachers she has uh, created so many doctors and to, uh, so many uh, uh, students so and uh, only at the this level also her passion to teach is incredible she takes all each, each and every opportunity uh, to uh, make sure that students are learned in a better and uh, simplified manner and uh, when we requested madam she readily agreed to take uh, most important topics in the uh, field of nephrology so sh uh, today she will be discussing about proteinuria for us uh, thank you, madam, and welcome uh, Welcome and over to you. Thank you, Dr. Rao, as the, for your introductory remarks. In the next 45 to 50 minutes, what I'm trying to do is, I will just give you a bird's eye view of proteinuria. When we were students, we were taught that urinalysis is the non-invasive biopsy of the kidney. And only important component of the urinalysis is proteinuria. Hippocrates, as early as 2,400 years ago, he just related formy urine to kidney disease. Probably that was the start of the importance of proteinuria. So let us see what are the normal constituents of urine. Does normal urine, urine normally contain protein? How will you clinically approach and classify proteinuria? Based on case scenarios, how will you work up and what is the management? You know, it will be very brief because our topic is only proteinuria. Now, let us see what are the normal constituents of the urine. Major component of urine, 40% of urine is composed of TAM phosphate protein. Under 40% is albumin. The remaining 20% is from 32 plasma-derived proteins, which contains lysozymes, globulins, immunoglobulins, mucin, etc. So what is the normal excretion of albumin in the urine? It is around 5 to 10 milligram per day, but up to 30 milligram, we take it as normal. That is above 30 milligram per day, it is abnormal. We all had been taught or recently, not uh, we, when we became teachers, we knew there's an importance for microalbuminuria and macroalbuminuria. Now the terminology is changed because microalbuminuria, people thought that it is the size of the albumin that is reduced. So they have renamed that as moderately increased albuminuria, that is 30 to 300 milligram per day, and severely increased albuminuria, that is macroalbuminuria earlier thought as, as greater than 300 milligram per day. Now, what is the normal protein in serum and plant? We saw the normal value of protein in the urine. So serum protein, 6.5 to 8 gram. Albumin, 3.5 to 5.5 gram. Globulin is around 2 to 3.5 gram. Let us see what is significance. I think you should go back to your physiology and try to understand what is Gibbs donor and equilibrium, which I'll be discussing the next class. It is based on the fact that albumin is an impermeant solute. So being impermeant, it has the capacity to decide the distribution of permian solutes. It is also an important contributing factor for oncotic pressure. Now, last class also, we, when we discussed AEMA, we tried to understand Starling's law of physical forces, which shows that the hydrostatic pressure of capillaries tries to push the fluid from the capillary into interstitium which is opposed by the oncotic pressure exerted by albumin inside the capillary. So as and when the fluid transports into interstitia, the interstitial pressure will start going up. Since albumin is not filtered, the colloid oncotic pressure is not there. So the fluid will re-enter the vascular compartment, the lymphatic end. The important role here is played by the albumin. So what happens when there is albuminuria? When there is albuminuria, naturally there is a reduction in plasma or serum albumin, which contributes to decrease 
Albumin, as we said, is the important component of oncotic pressure. So when the albumin drops, there's a reduction in oncotic pressure. When there's a reduction in oncotic pressure, as we saw from Stalin's law of physical forces, there's an increased translation of fluid in the cesium. The decreased oncotic pressure also stimulates the synthesis of cholesterol and other lipids. Having said that, let us see how we are going to approach proteinuria. Proteinuria can be classified into transient proteinuria. When we say transient proteinuria, it may be on routine examination detected when somebody is febrile after heavy physical exercise, a heavy protein diet, extreme cold, a infective states, inflammatory states. The proteinuria will be transiently there and it will disappear. Another important condition we have to bear in main, mind is orthostatic proteinuria, which we'll be seeing in a little detail later. There will be an elevated protein excretion while in the upright position, but the protein excretion will be normal when the patient is resting in a supine position. Now we have the persistent proteinuria, which can be classified into overflow proteinuria, glomerular proteinuria, tubular proteinuria, and nephrogenous proteinuria. So let us see based on case scenarios one by one. Proteinuria can be classified also based on the protein content in the urine. If somebody excretes more than 3.5 gram per meter square in 24 hours, or in children it is more than 50 milligram per kg, we identify them as having nephrotic proteinuria. So naturally, when the proteinuria falls below less than 3.5 gram in adults or less than 50 milligram per kg in children, in patients with normal GFR and normal serum albumin, these definitions would appear, would apply. So what are the types of protein? It can be an either albumin or a low molecular weight protein. Now, a, earlier, we knew that proteinuria was classified based on size and charge. So size-selective proteinuria, I forgot to uh, show you the picture of the glomerular filter. It has got a capillary membrane, which has got a lamina, para, interna, externa, and it's also an epithelial layer and the endothelial layer, layer, which will prevent the normal exit of protein from the blood into the urine. So when the protein size is more than 20,000 Daltons, the protein cannot pass through. So it's called a size selective proteinuria. In charge selective proteinuria, the charge of the basement membrane will repel the charge particles. That is how albumin is normally not exiting the blood. So this can be easily identified by calculating the selectivity index. This was given by Cameron and Blanfoam. What is the formula? Is the ratio of immunoglobulin G in urine divided by serum immunoglobulin G into serum transferrin by urine transferrin. So proteinuria was considered highly selective if this index was less than 0 0.010 and moderately selective if it was between 0 0.11 and 0 0.2 and non-selective it was more than 0 0.2. We should always remember in those days when biopsy was not there, we used to calculate the selective proteinuria and the selectivity index is highly selective. It was suggestive of a charge selective proteinuria. That means the glomerular membrane is intact. Something has gone with the charge. That is why you are getting protein in the urine. So the formula is urinary immunoglobulin by serum immunoglobulin G into serum transferrin by urine transferrin. Now, we all should know how to examine urine for protein. The laboratory technicians do, but we should know what is being done. If we do not know how it is being done, we will not be able to check whether they are doing the test correctly or not. Normal protein in the urine is around 150 milligram. It can vary from 2 to 10 milligram per deciliter. So what is the ideal sample which you have to check for protein? It is the early morning sample because it will be the concentrated sample. What are the tests you do for detection of protein? We have qualitative tests and quantitative tests. The tests that are given in red are the tests commonly used in the lab. 
heat coagulation test and sulfosalicylic acid test. For the quantification of protein in the urine, you do the S-batch test. Other tests we use is RIPSIC, which is a protein reagent strip test, and urine protein electrophoresis. Let us see one by one. So what is the heat coagulation test? When we were housings, we used to go to the side lab and we used to check for protein in the urine by ourselves. So you have to fill two-thirds of the test tube with urine, acidify with two or three drops of acetic, glacial acetic acid, 3%. Keep the upper part of the test tube. That is for comparison, the lower part. There will be a coagulum formed in the upper part. If there is protein, phosphates, or urates. So how do you distinguish whether it is protein, urate, or urate, uh, phosphate? You add, again, three to four drops of acetic acid, if the coagulum persists, if it does not dissolve, it is due to protein. If it is to phosphate, it will dissolve in acetic acid. Add two drops of nitric acid, that will detect mucin and that also will get dissolved. So in short, if you boil, two-thirds of the test tube, the upper part is boiled. If it's an insoluble coagulum in acetic acid, that is more likely to be protein because phosphates also give a positive test with boiling test. Now, what is the advantage? It's a cheap test which does not require any technical expertise. We can do in the site lab. What is the disadvantage? It cannot tell you what type of protein is being lost in the urine. Now, we have the sulfosalicylic acid test, again, which is being done in the lab. We use 20% sulfosalicylic acid. Principle is it precipitates proteins by chemicals. Whenever you test urine, you have to make sure the pH is acidic. You know, many positive, false positive tests can be obtained or false negative tests can be obtained in an alkaline urine. So you have to test with the litmus paper if the urine pH is acidic or alkaline. If it is alkaline, you add two ml of acidic acid, acetic acid and make it acidic. Then to it, add 2 ml of sulfosalicylic acid. Again, there will be a cloudness. Based on the thickness of the cloud, you can grade it into 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, etc. We should always remember that 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus does not exactly tell you what is the exact amount of protein. Because if, if you dissolve 10 gram of salt in 10 ml of water, it gives a very thick solution. If you take it, and dissolve in 100 ml, it will be very dilute. Same way, if the urine is very dilute, even if the albumin, the protein excreted is large, it may give 1 plus. On the other hand, if it's a concentrated urine, even a small quantity of protein in the urine may give you a 3 plus positivity. So it just tells you whether there's a protein in the urine or not. Beyond that, you cannot quantify based on the presence of protein in the urine by the SPAX test, uh, sulfosalicylic acid test. Now, what are the disadvantages? There are some drugs which interfere with the test. Now, we hardly use any of them. Tolbutamide was earlier available as rash. Now, this is an oral hypoglycemic drug. Paraaminosalicylic acid, again, early used as a tetrabaglis medicine. Penicillin, we hardly use penicillin now because of anaphylactic fear. High concentration of urine is likely to happen in myeloma. Sulfonamides, and if you use a contrast for a pilogram that is also now hardly done. So these tests can interfere with the presence of protein in the urine by sulfosalicylic acid test. Now, how you quantify protein? Again, we used to do in the side lab, there is what is called as an s batch albinometer. The reagent used is picric acid in citric acid. You have to collect the 24 hour urine sample which should be filtered and acidified with 10% acetic acid. Whenever you ask somebody to collect 24-hour urine, we have to make sure the patient understands what you are saying because they, they, have, they wake up at 6 o'clock, they have to empty the bladder because that will empty whatever urine is being secreted in the kidney earlier. So empty the bladder, then thereafter start collecting whatever urine patient passes in the bottle given. And at the end of the day, Next day when they wake up at the same time, 6 o'clock, they should include that sample also in the collection. That is why 
this is a little difficult cumbersome process and however you must instruct the patients they make errors in collection so albuminometer is filled with urine up to the mark u s back series is added up to the mark r mix well and keep the tube vertically leave it for 24 hours you can read it directly as grams per liter there will be a precipitate and there is a tube is graduated so directly you can read how much of protein is there non liter of urine if the specific of the urine is more than is concentrated it should be diluted in one point needs to two or needs to four that is the material we are not doing now advantages it's an easy and cheap method quantitative estimation of albumin is possible but the disadvantage picric acid is highly highly hygroscopic so it cannot be repeatedly used on the pack is open just use immediately so that will be the uh, that will be not that will not be cost effective now what do you use now we use the reagent strip method for detection of protein this strip area is impregnated with an indicator tetrabromophenol blue or tetrabromophenolphthalein we have to use acetic acid and there's a ph paper should be used ph of the urine should be recorded if it is alkaline again it should be acidified with few drops of acetic acid then the strip should be dipped in the urine if the protein is present in the urine the color of the band will change so depending on the color if it is light blue it is mild proteinuria if it is green it is moderate proteinuria greenish blue it is severe proteinuria what are the advantages it's very sensitive it can detect up to 10 mg per 100 ml of albumin easy to perform does not require any expertise it can be performed bedside if the urine is turbid due to other reason it does not affect the test what are the disadvantages it mainly detects only albumin there are certain drugs which can give false positive chloroquine quinidine trimethoprim which are commonly used and citrimide which is used for cleaning and strongly alkaline urine also gives a positive test so with that we will go on to case study so the last 10 minutes we saw how protein is detected in the urine protein is normally present in the urine the main protein in the urine is albumin and dermos for protein the remaining 20% is contributed by glob globulins lysozymes enzymes mucin etc and based on that can classify proteinuria in the charge selective size selective nephrotic non nephrotic transient or persistent now let us see the first case history this 10 year old girl with no comorbidities presented with fever physical examination was unremarkable significant finding on investigation was proteinuria what are the other urine checks you do you look for sediment rbcs and rb rbc cast the urine did not show any sediment what is the next test you will quantify proteinuria so anybody what would be the probable cause you think is a cause of proteinuria in this child any answers can you hear me yes ma'am yes ma'am clearly you are audible ma'am uh, so nephrotic syndrome they are answering you ask your students to answer yes ma'am they are answering as nephrotic syndrome oh, okay i can't hear it but okay mm. so next PSGN. is called, uh, uh, dr shamav is telling psgn and uh, dr kiran babu is telling as a uh, uh, nephrotic syndrome madam okay so next test is quantify proteinuria 25 urine test is the most accurate but there can be errors in collection as we discussed so the child is reevaluated after one month child was febrile recovered from the acute febrile illness proteinuria persisted uh, let me say straight away that is not nephrotic because the child did not have any massive proteinuria or edema it is not psgn because the urine did not contain any rbc or rbc cast okay so we are left with persistent proteinuria which can be orthostatic proteinuria because had it been a transient proteinuria due to fever it would have disappeared once the child developed recovered from the acute febrile illness so how do you confirm it is an orthostatic proteinuria we demonstrate 
urinary protein excretion separately during daytime and the superimposter at night. That is a split urine test. So how do you define orthostatic proteinuria? For that, the total protein excretion should be normal. It should not be above 150 milligram. In children, the normal protein excretion, as we said, is less than 100 milligram per meter square per day. In adults, it is 50 milligram for eight hours, to contributing to 150 milligram per day. So elevated protein excretion while in the upright position and normal protein excretion in a supine or recumbent position will tell you it is orthostatic proteinuria. This is the most frequent cause of isolated proteinuria in children, especially adolescents, adolescents between 6 and 15 years, contributing to 0.7%. What are the two approaches to document this? Most convenient standard method is protein creatinine ratio. There is no question of collection. There is no question of error. You just take a random sample or the early morning sample, look at the protein creatinine ratio, both in the recumbent poster and in the upright position. But then the disadvantage is there are two determinations coming on protein and creatinine. If there is error in one of the estimation, the whole value can be wrong. But usually now there are auto analyzers which give you very clear, accurate values of protein and creatinine. So there is no error of collection. So we can use the convenient standard method. When you are in doubt, you can go to the most accurate method. That is a 24 urine collection divided into separate daytime and nighttime collections. Now, what are the instructions you would give to the patient? Because they are one of the common things you have to identify. The parents will be very anxious, you know. They say urine contains protein. And everybody is so much worried about kidney disease. Does my child have, as you said, nephrotic state? Is it going to progress? So we have to give them very clearly instructions as to collect the urine. Because any error in collection will produce false positive reports. What they have to do is discard the first morning urine. Patient should be normally active during day. Collect all of the urine each time patient voids. Patient has to lie down two hours before sleeping and collect the sample at the end of two hours into the daytime urine collection bag. After eight hours of sleeping, collect the first morning sample, that the nighttime collection bag into the second bag. Now estimate the protein in each bag separately. That will tell you what is the excretion date. So how do you calculate? Total protein content will be total protein content by 24. Nighttime protein collection will be protein in the nighttime by sleeping hours. If it is 8 hours, protein in nighttime by 8 hours. This child has 90 milligram per meter square per day with two-third in the daytime sample. Hence, it is most likely to be orthostatic proteinuria. What are the differential diagnoses? Exclude transient proteinuria, which can be seen acute febrileness as the child had after vigorous exercise. Exposure to extreme cold. Persistent proteinuria, not due to orthostatic cause, you will have increased protein both during day and night. And moreover, the total protein excreted will be above normal. So, this child is probably having orthostatic proteinuria. What is the prognosis? It's a benign condition. There is no adverse effect on renal function. This may resolve over time. No specific treatment is required. What are the pathogenesis of this? It can be a normal variant, you know. Total protein may be normal, but the child somehow excretes more protein in the upright posture. There can be subtle changes which are not significant, which can be demonstrated by electron microscopy, like mesenchymal hypercellularity or basement membrane thickening. There can be an abnormal glomerular hemodynamics, which can produce proteinuria in the upright posture or what is called a nutcracker syndrome. What is nutcracker syndrome? Nutcracker syndrome? Anybody? The chat box they have given, no? Huh? Oh, yes, ma'am. They are answering there. The chat box or what? The down below, ma'am, there is an option called chat. If you click on that, you will... And I see. No answers for this. Not for... Uh, ma'am, for previous question, uh, previous case, uh, Dr. Shambhav is asking, Ma'am, what is the relevance of fever in the case of orthostatic proteinuria? If there is fever and there is proteinuria, you have to think it is associated with fever. So, you have to reevaluate the child after the fever subsides. 
So whenever somebody is febrile, there is an increased excretion of protein in the urine. That is the significance. You can't jump and say this is a real disease that is causing proteinuria. Okay. Th that is the relevance. For this case, they are answering it as a venous compression of a renal vein. Um, okay, somewhat. Uh, what happened? So this is left renal vein entrapment, or it is called as a nutcracker syndrome. This is the entrapment of the left renal vein via the aorta and the superior mesenteric artery. It can be also, also associated with angiotensin II release. That can result in orthostatic proteinuria. 47 Korean children evaluated by Doppler ultrasonography. 30 of them had left renal vein flow abnormalities. So this could be one of those rare causes of nutcracker syndrome as well. How do you manage these children? Annual random urine sample for protein. 24 hours after the solution of acute illness, fever, or strenuous exercise. You should look for protein in the urine only if somebody is walking a mile and come back and doing a urine test. Uh, that will not confirm or exclude your orthostatic proteinuria. Okay. Now let us go to the case two. This 60 year old man presented to nephro OPD with complaints of generalized edema. No history of hematuria, no similar episodes in the past. Systemic history was unremarkable for type 2 diabetes, NSAID intake, systemic hypertension, hypothyroidism. Clinical examination, patient was edematous but normal tensive. Systemic examination was unremarkable except for tenderness over L5 spine. Investigation on boiling test and sulfosalicylic acid test showed proteinuria, but dipstick was negative. Creatinine is 1.2, EGFR was 60 ml per minute. So, what is the cause of proteinuria? What do you call this? Anybody? Multiple myeloma, ma'am. Ah, absolutely. Who said that? Kishan, no? uh, Dr. Shambhavi, ma'am. She's answering oh, okay, everything okay. Uh, very well. So, what is the I can't see in the chat box her answers. I don't know why. Okay. Mm. So, history of elderly man, tenderness, elbow, spine, edema, dipstick negative, sulfosalic acid positive. Dipstick detects only albumin. Hence, urine protein unlikely to be albumin. That is a clue. Sulfosalicylic acid detects both albumin and globulin in the urine. So, most likely, the protein in urine is globulin. What is the common light chain that is excreted? It is Benz Johns protein. It is a light chain. How do you test? The simple test is acidify the urine, heat the urine sample to 56 degrees in a water bath. I don't know any of you have done that. We have been doing all this, you know, when we were house ends. In a water bath for 15 minutes, the precipitate will appear. Then you continue heating to boiling, that is 100 degree, the precipitate will dissolve. That shows it is a light chain and not albumin. Now we have better methods like urine electrophoresis, which will show you light chain. So other tests in the urine are light chain assay. Urine kappa lambda ratio is commonly done now when you suspect myeloma. A kappa lambda ratio greater than 6.2 suggests the presence of monoclonal kappa light chains. A kappa lambda ratio less than 0.7 suggests monoclonal light chains, lambda light chain. We should always remember if the kappa and lambda are raised simultaneously, the ratio will remain the same. It is not significant. In monoclonal gammopathy, only one light chain, either kappa or lambda will increase, giving rise to an alteration in the ratio. In this patient, kappa lambda ratio is 5. So, what is the cause of proteinuria? It is overflow proteinuria. So, what is overflow proteinuria? There is an increased filtration of low molecular weight proteins through a normal glomerular filtration barrier. We said that no, low molecular weight proteins are usually filtered, but it is reabsorbed by the proximal tubule and catabolized.
But here what happens is there is an overproduction of light chains, which is filtered in increasing amount. It will exceed the reabsorptive capacity of the tubule. And so it spills into the urine. So what are the common causes? In rhabdomyolysis, myoglobinuria. In hemolysis, hemoglobinuria. And common causes, light chains, as somebody said, in myeloma. So what is sequelae of this? This is toxic to the tubule. It can produce acute kidney injury. One of the causes for acute renal failure in myeloma is light chain nephropathy. The paraprotein deposition can injure the glomerulus, producing glomerulopathy leading to albumin loss also. So that may be the reason why this patient had edema as well. What are the other investigations? We have to do a serum electrophoresis. We do a band. We do a immunoelectrophoresis. Here the uric acid was 10.6 as expected in myeloma. Hypercalcemia is there with calcium of 13. Benzone 14 was positive. But what is the gold standard? It's a bone marrow. More than 30% plasma cells in the bone marrow, the diagnosis is multiple myeloma. So this is what is called as the overflow proteinuria. Now let us go to next case. This is a 36-year-old lady, married lady, which we had, uh, who came to our OP recently, with only normal pregnancy, presented with history of generalized edema. Systemic history, systemic history was remarkable for arthritis, alopecia, there was no pre-existing illness, normal pregnancy, no decompensation during pregnancy, no previous episodes. She was edematous. Her blood pressure was 150 by 100 in the right upper limb. Otherwise, systemic examination was unremarkable. There was no arthritis, no deformities. Investigation showed a 3 plus proteinuria, numerous RBCs. We should always remember that a urine loaded with RBCs with 80% dysmorphic RBCs is equivalent to seeing an RBC cast in the urine, which is equivalent to active glomerular nephritis. Okay. So if we see urine sediment loaded with RBC, the next investigation immediately you should ask for is a urine culture because urinary tract infection is the most common cause for hematuria. Here the culture was negative. 25 urinary protein was 6 gram with albumin of 2, 2 serum albumin of 2.5. Fortunately for her, the creatinine was 1.2. She has blot, grossly altered lipid profile. Total cholesterol of 25, triglyceride of 210, LDL of 90 with a normal HDL. So, any guess? What is the lupus cause of proteinuria here? Lupus. Lupus. What is the cause of proteinuria? What type of proteinuria is this? We had classified earlier, no? You will see in the classification. So here, what you have said, nephrotic, nephrotic range, syndrome. nephrotic range, uh, proteinuria. Ah, nephrotic range proteinuria with raw albumin. Okay, nephrotic syndrome with systemic symptoms. So whenever you say nephrotic proteinuria, it is always due to a glomerular cause. But non-nephrotic proteinuria will not exclude a glomerular cause. You understand the difference? If somebody has got more than 3.5 per meter square in 24 hours, it is always due to a glomerular disease. But if somebody excretes only 2 grams, you cannot say it is not a glomerular disease. So that is the importance. So nephrotic proteinuria always confirms a glomerular disease. Absence of nephrotic proteinuria will not exclude a glomerular disease. Here, the patient had massive proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, which was erected serially with albumin infusions. We did the renal biopsy, which showed IgA vasculitis. You know, though we expected lupus, the biopsy came as IgA vasculitis. Now, what I want to make out here is, if somebody has got, if a child comes with nephrotic proteinuria, normal GFR, low albumin, hyperlipidemia, what will be your first diagnosis? What will your pathology you expect on the kidney? Anybody? PSG, uh, PSGN or minimal change the uh, nephrotic. Uh, not PSGN, minimal change properly. Okay, you are right. This minimal change properly. Now, a 65 year old uh, patient presented to OP with loss of appetite, vomiting, and normal urine volume. He had no edema, no oliguria, normal blood pressure. 
there is a history of NSAID intake for cardiac one week back. Investigation showed urinalysis, proteinuria plus, WBC norm, numerous, cuts are negative. 24 unit protein was 1.8 gram and CN creatin was 1.8. So this patient had significant proteinuria but in a non-nephrotic state. Absent edema, minimal, no edema, normal blood pressure, normal urine volume. So how do you differentiate the glomerular disease from interstitial disease? Presence of edema, presence of hypertension, RBCs in the urine will, con will indicate a glomerular disease, though it can occur also and oliguria. But a normal urine volume, normal blood pressure, non-nephrotic proteinuria, predominantly pyuria will suggest a tubular interstitial disease. So whenever you see numerous WBCs in the urine, you should not diagnose urinary tract infection. The favorite question is, what are the conditions for sterile pyuria? Any answers? You understand what I'm asking? Urine is loaded with WBCs, but the urine culture is sterile. So what is your thought process? What are the conditions that could produce sterile pyuria? TB, ma'am. TB. Pardon? TB. Okay, you are right. Tuberculosis, then. Uh, RCC, ma'am. Pardon? So, sorry, the bladder carcinoma. Um, bladder carcinoma, okay. Hematuria predominantly, okay. You are right, then. Any Think renal of common calculus? conditions first, common treatable conditions first. Renal calculus. The first cause you should think is this patient was partially treated elsewhere. He would have received some antibiotics. That is, the culture is negative. Patient is having pyuria. Second is, we are routinely using agar media. So, anaerobic organisms and such of fastidious organisms, the media, will not grow in such media. So, it could be due to fastidious organisms which cannot be isolated or ordinary culture media. Then third is what you said, Sterile acid pyuria, you should always consider mycobacterium tuberculosis. Then the non-infectious causes like, as you said, calculi, neoplasms, collagen disorders, etc., etc. Okay, so whenever somebody has got a pyuria, you do a culture, ask for history of antibiotics if the culture is negative, and then proceed with other investigations. So significant proteinuria, normal blood pressure, normal urine volume, will indicate a tubular interstitial disease. Here, the probable cause for proteinuria will be a tubular proteinuria. What are the causes for tubular proteinuria? Diseases affecting the proximal tubule and interstitial. There is a decreased absorption of low molecular weight protein, predominantly beta-2 microglobulin, not macro, microglobulin. The amount of protein in the urine will be less than 2 gram. So what are the causes? It could be acute interstitial nephritis, immunosuppressive medications, analgesics, usually NSAIDs, Sjogren's syndrome. Okay, so these are some of the causes for tubular proteinuria. Last but the not, not the least, actually when I joined my DM, first time when I went for rounds, my chief asked me, what is the protein that is seen in the urine not present in the plasma? So somehow, uh, not knowing what I'm saying, I said damn household protein. And that was the correct answer. So that is a protein which is synthesized by the distal tubule, otherwise called as uromorlin. That is an important constituent of normal urine protein. About 40% is contributed by damn household protein. So to summarize what I've said, I told you what are the proteins that are normally present in the urine. What is the significance of proteinuria? What are the tests we do to detect protein in the urine? How do you classify proteinuria? What is the importance of recognizing orthostatic proteinuria? You should not end up doing biopsy or unnecessarily investigating, especially in children. You should, whenever you think there is no real cause, you should always do the split urine test, either a protein to ratio, which is easy in the daytime sample and the nighttime sample. Nighttime, you can ask them to bring the first void sample in the morning. For the daytime sample, you can ask in a random when the child is normally active. 
So you should exclude orthostatic proteinuria. You should repeat this test after an acute febrile illness or a physical activity or a heavy protein meal, etc. And if you think the protein is significant, you should proceed depending on what the clinical history and examination warrants. There is no substitute for a good history and a clinical examination. I would summarize by saying that all the investigations we do are only ancillary tools to our diagnosis. The diagnosis should come to your mind when you take a detailed history and physical examination. Thank you very much. Members, if you have any questions, you can directly ask the madam. Uh, or else uh, you can put it in the comment section also in YouTube video. I'll forward it to madam and get it answered at her convenience. Uh, madam, I all students are thanking you. There is time now. They can take three or four questions can be taken now because there is time. Madam, someone is asking uh, the difference between PCR and ACR. Dr. Kiran Babu. Dr. Kiran Babu is asking you, what's the difference between PCR and ACR? I do not understand. CPR and APR. Huh? PCR and ACR, madam. Albumin excretion can... rate and protein excretion rate. If, if it is PER and AER, I, is it what she's Kiran asking? Babu, Dr. Kiran, you can directly ask madam now. You can uh, unmute yourself and ask madam. Yes, the protein creatine ratio and albumin creatine ratio, ma'am. Ah, the protein creatine ratio it includes all proteins, albumin, other globulins, etc. When you look albumin creatine ratio, you are specifically looking for albumin. That is why the microalbuminuria, now called as moderately elevated albuminuria, indicates more than thirty milligram, but less than three hundred milligram of albumin in the urine, not protein. So that is albumin excretion rate. But there that you include all proteins that are seen in the urine. That is the difference. Madam, someone is asking, can you please elaborate on UACR? Urine you, albumin creatine ratio. UACR, madam. You are usually urine albumin creatine ratio can be done on a 24-hour urine sample. You can specifically look for quantify albumin. You can quantify creatinine and find out the ratio. But because we are errors in collection, what we do is we do an overnight, ask the patient not to avoid during night. Overnight first sample is taken and that sample we estimate for albumin and creatinine. So the albumin creatinine ratio, if I remember right, is 20 by 200 microgram of millimole of creatinine. Because the creatinine excretion in the urine is around... Uh, 20 milligram per kg in males and 17 milligram per kg in females. So when you check the creatinine in the urine, the, especially in the 24 hour sample, that also tells you an idea where the correction is accurate, collection is accurate. So albumin is for albumin excretion rate and protein excretion rate, creatinine estimation is the same. For albumin specific radio assay or SPLC, you do estimate albumin only. And you equate the ratio. It is ideally done in the overnight sample. If there is an increased excretion, that is 20 to 200 microgram per minute or 30 to 300 milligram per day, that indicates an earlier start of endothelial injury. Hope I have answered what you asked. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, Dr. Kiran Babu is, uh, have an additional question on that. In uh, PCR or ACR, which is best for uh, CKD? Which one to consider? CKD. In chronic kidney disease, you know, I, you should not do a protein gradient ratio. This protein gradient ratio has been validated only in patients with normal GFR. The simple reason is when the patient develops chronic kidney disease, the tubular secretion of creatinine will increase. So the value may not be accurate at all. So the validation of protein gradient ratio or album creatinine ratio has been done only in patients with a normal GFR or more up to 60 ml. Beyond that, we have to go for 24 collection only. Uh, Ma'am, Dr. Chandan is asking, what is microalbuminuria and what is large white kidney? Microalbuminuria has been now renamed as moderately elevated albuminuria. 
that is what I said, 30 to 300 milligram per day. Large white kidney, earlier, now the terminology is not there. It indicates a chronic kidney disease. Mama, what is tubular and overflow proteinuria? Overflow protein is something which you get in multiple myeloma. There is an increased production which cannot be handled by the tubules. Now, glomerulus filters all the uh, protein that is being produced by the cells. Myeloma, whether, whether it is uh, myoglobin, hemoglobin, or a light chain that is filtered by the glomerulus. But the tubules usually take up all this and catabolize into amino acids and send them back to blood. But when the filtered load is increased, that cannot handle this, that will exceed the reabsorptive capacity that gets excreted into the urine. That is the overflow proteinuria. In tubular proteinuria, there is a disease of the tubular interstitia. The production of protein remains the same, but whatever globulins or light chains are filtered, that cannot be handled by the disease interstitia. That is why it is excreting in the urine. Understand? Understood. One glomerulus tubule synthesis normal in overflow proteinuria. In tubular proteinuria, glomerulus is normal, interstitial is disease, production is normal. That is the difference. Yes, ma'am. Understood. Uh, I think uh, if you have any other questions, uh, you can directly post it in a YouTube video. Okay. We will uh, direct it to madam and... Uh, get them answered uh, excellent participation by the members i really appreciate it so many uh, more than 120 students were there in youtube and uh, uh, 12 14 students in uh, zoom and all have answered uh, been uh, actively answering uh, and uh, made it uh, made the session very interactive uh, thank you madam thank you for the wonderful session uh, learned a lot really and uh, proteinuria is a very madam any concluding remarks from your side please uh, no, it, and I, as I said, you know, proteinuria is a hallmark of kidney disease. Okay. But it should not be taken lightly. When you take protein in the urine, you should exclude tra transient proteinuria. You should make sure it's a persistent proteinuria, but repeated checking. And if the proteinuria is significant, you should proceed to investigate. Because maybe an early marker of CKD. I understood. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's the importance. Uh, Madam has already stressed upon. Uh, thank you so much for uh, Madam uh, for your valuable time and uh, insights. Uh, hope you uh, take many more classes like this for us and uh, uh, help our students. Thank you so much and all the active participants also. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rao, for the opportunity. Okay. Yes, ma'am.